So my name is Pablo Valentin. I'm the coordinator of new student programs. The lovely class of 2024 is probably delightfully tired of seeing my face as they have been watching videos of me since their admittance. But once again, it is lovely to be here with all of y'all. Uh, hi, my name is Cam Wade. Uh, I'm a rising junior this year. I am um, working on the PA team. You know, I get to work with Pablo and all my wonderful co-workers. Um, and I also work with uh, Dr. Booker in the Diversity and Inclusion Office. Um, so I'm super excited about meeting everyone this year. I think it's going to be a fun year. Okay. Mr. Oni? Ladies first. Okay. Well, um, I guess it's good afternoon, class of 2024. My name is Dr. Angela Booker. I'm the Director of Diversity and Inclusion. And so my office has been up and running since October 1st of 2019. So I'm so excited to be here and look forward to seeing your smiling faces in the fall. Well, I'm Sam Oni. I was a student at Mercer a few years ago, just a few short years ago. <laughs> and, uh, it's good to be back uh, to join in the effort to welcome you future Mercerians. And it is great to have you back, sir. Um, we, we really are honored to, to be able to have this opportunity to um, speak with you as our, our class of 24. 2024 has just um, read out of the Mercer Reader an interview um, that you were a part of where you, you gave some great background um, into your Mercer experience as well as some pieces of your childhood and that journey that brought you um, to Mercer University. So what we'd love to do is to um, ask you some questions but also just see where the conversation goes. I think it's important for our first year students to to really just understand the importance of, of story and narrative and, and conversation as a whole. Um, so my question, I had two, but I'll just stick to one right totally now. Only allowed one and a half. Okay, don't <laughs> um, so I remember, cause I took an INT class on race and racism. And what is INT? We, um, it's the uh, understanding self and others. It's our like writing program. Huh. Okay. And so we actually read your interview in my um, INT class. So this is like not my first time, you know, seeing it. Um, but one of the things that really stuck out to me was like at the end of it, you were basically talking about how um, you were talking about how I think somebody had asked you like, what was the hardest part about being here? Yes. And I remember at the very beginning, you were talking about how like, all, just like being here in general was just like hard, but you had kind of just like, persisted through it so I want to know like what kind of advice would you give specifically to just like you know black students especially like right now because you know there's a lot of anti-black violence and rhetoric going on like what kind of you know advice would you give them I guess because I feel like sometimes especially like with everything that's going on I feel like you know just as a black person I feel like the community can be very divisive sometimes um, and not like working together. So I just wanted to know like kind of like what is some advice you would give just like overall to like black students with like, you know, creating solidarity like with one another. Yes, I, my take on the race issue is polar opposite of most people. Uh, because I start, I start from the standpoint of it, it's just been nonsensical, all right? It's, it's an absurdity. Uh, Jesus didn't mention a word about black people. Neither did he say anything about white people. And you can go run the ga gamut. And, and, and the absurdity of it all, it's, man it's made so, <laughs> so manifest in the fact that we can't even pick the right color to define ourselves. Because I've yet to meet a white person. And I have yet to meet a black person. And I'm being deadly serious. Yeah. You see how absurd the whole thing is? And what I and I gave up for that, it's for that reason that I gave up on the human race. I just I just said enough. So I don't deal with race. That's another absurdity. I deal, I'm a member of humankind. And we're kind of special. And I'm going to invite 
the Dr. Booker to become a member of our group. <laughs> Thank you. Humankind. And we have a special religion. You may be a Christian or a Muslim or whatever, but our special religion is human kindness. Okay. Human kindness. Uh, Cam, when you have that and you're true to yourself, yes? Uh, the philosopher, I think it was Greek, uh, know thyself and what? To thy yes, own then, self be true. Be true. Mm -hmm. yeah. Once you know, you know that I am who I am by the grace of God and my sister is who she is by the grace of God and uh, you don't even have to be a Christian. I adopted something else that makes me become a member of the human humankind uh, easy for me. I adopted the, the greeting by, uh, by our East Indian friends. When an East, East, East Indian, not all of them, because they also have their, their tribes and, and uh, ethnic groups, but more often than not, they'll put their palms together, right? Palms together. And they will utter, will take a slight bow, and they will utter the word Namaste. And what Namaste means is, I acknowledge the divine that dwells in you as well as in me. Cam, are you beginning to see that I, my different take uh, for uh, incoming students? My job, what I want to take on as a mission is to try to get people to transcend this absurdity of race and celebrate our being members of, 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 of being human uh, and celebrating that rather than allowing this artificial nonsense. And if God and if Christ didn't say one word uh, pertaining to race, then where did and where and how did Tatnall Square Baptist Church? You know, we know what we got. Is that Newman Hall now? New Newton. New Newton. No, 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 New Newton. Newton Hall. Yeah, that was Tatnall Square Baptist Church, right there on campus, and. For most Baptist students on the Mercer campus in 1963, that was God sent because it was convenient. And in those days, it wasn't everybody, every student that owned the car. So if, you, if you're a Christian and you, you're inclined to want to worship on a Sunday, the church is right there. Convenient. Well, I arrived on campus. Uh, you might have read this in the inter interview too. I arrived on campus on a Friday as a freshman. And on Saturday afternoon, barely 24 hours later, there was a knock on my dormitory door. I opened the door and standing there was this elderly white man who proceeded to introduce himself. I am Reverend Clifton Forrester, he said. I am the pastor of Tatnall Square Baptist Church. And Sam, I've come to let you know that you won't be welcome to worship at Tatnall Square Baptist Church. Well, it was a jolt, uh, but, but it was also a mixture of righteous indignation because after all, Tatnall Square was among many, that consortium of Baptist churches that you know, put their nickels and dimes together that, that enabled them to send missionaries to my part of the world. So here am I arriving among them and uh, nothing less than, you know, you know open arm uh, jubilation, you know. We have one a savage soul from the jungles of Africa, you know, into, into the Christian for you. But it, it was the opposite of what was what happened. 
what I'm suggesting, what I'm preaching now is that all of that, the thing that inspired that, uh, that minister to come to me with that message, is a distortion of the teaching of our, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. His teaching was reconciliation. And I think that was that rec that idea of reconciliation was probably what inspired Dr. Rufus Harris, the then president of Mercer University, to say it is high time Mercer University be opened to all of God's children. And um, and. Uh, Dr. Harris uh, had expressed this, 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 this uh, desire to um, Harris Mobley, a Mercer graduate, a Mercer alumnus who had gone to the mission field in Ghana. He and I had become friends and uh, it was he, it was from him that I began learning when I, when I started seeing police dogs and fire hoses uh, attacking black people in America that I turned to, because most of the other missionaries were too embarrassed, too defensive to, uh, to answer my question in any direct way. And it was later on in retrospect, I said, okay, after I arrived in America and discovered the true nature of uh, segregation, that these missionaries had come, had come to Africa from way across Georgia, Milledgeville, Georgia, um, Valdosta, Georgia, uh, Memphis, Tennessee, Jacksonville, Mississippi, Birmingham, Alabama. They have gone, they have got, grown up in these segregated cities, communities in the South. They had attended segregated public schools. And the most telling of their experiences was the fact that every Sunday, what happened? they attended segregated church services in their hometowns. And I said to myself, when I finally arrived here and began to put things in perspective, and I said to myself, well, well the, the good Lord must have a sense of humor. That if you're gonna pick people to go into the jungles of Africa, particularly, Cam, particularly to the slave coast, that's where Ghana, Nigeria, that's where the, the slaves were captured. As a matter of fact, just this past year, uh, 2019, Ghana had a commemoration, it's called uh, the Year of Return, it was called, in which commemorating the 400, 400th anniversary of the first slaves being captured from the slave coast, that is West Africa, and brought into the New World arriving, I forgot the name of the place, but it's um, the, actually the New York Times did a 1619 project that is worth your, your checking out. Uh, excellent, excellent, excellently done. I've listened to the woman who did it uh, in several interviews. So the, the, the place of landing of the first, I think there were, uh, well, and, and I don't think there were too many um, that where they landed on the coast of Virginia, right? Mm -hmm. But the greatest invention of the Western world, greatest in the neg negative sense of it, it's racism because of the massive damage. Do you remember the Germans? The Germans were among the most sophisticated Europeans hmm? in education, in the sciences. And you cannot go to a classical music concert without playing some German repertoire. You know, and the composer from Bach to Beethoven to, to uh, Mozart and so on and so on. Sophisticated. And in spite of all that, they were Christians. They managed to roast, that is R-O-A-S-T, six million other human beings. in the name of racism, which is a myth, myth which is fiction. And uh, yeah, so I, I, I went to Montgomery, Alabama. I went to Birmingham, Alabama, you know, uh, reminded of things that happened in the past. 
but how do you, Pablo, uh, Cam, how do you, uh, Ansley, sh shake yourself loose of the event on Minneapolis? Did you see the look on that policeman's face? It was just like, oh, well, you know, I'm just, you, you, with his a knee planted on that man's neck. And he was, he couldn't have been more nonchalant if he had tried. Had this blank look on his face that this is routine, you know, this is, uh, this, this is, if he, if it was a goat that he was, he had his, his, his knee planted on, 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 on its neck. Uh, he couldn't have been less, less um, cavalier about it. So it is very much alive. Well, in, in, in Georgia, uh, our, our brother in Brunswick, he was in Brunswick. Yeah, uh, jogging. Yeah. And then Brianna. You're, you were after a long day or long, long night because she was an uh, um, emergency, anyway, of, 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 work, of work. You get home, you're sleeping in your own bed. So it is very much with us. And and I am going to propose to, Mercer's uh, already doing it. Mercer, about 30% of the student body is black. I mean, it's, 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 and that didn't happen by accident. And I commended the president for it because, you know, after that first step in 1963, Mercer had committed itself because this, to see a need for, for, for equality. And I'm sure I don't have to be on campus to know that uh, provided support system for these students who might have come from rather uh, uh, you know, the, the schools that didn't adequately prepare them for, for uh, life in, on a university campus. And it's consistent with that, that this culture is also going to be, be, be uh, installed to continue to remind us that we are indeed one and every effort that can be made to help hasten the day when we will no longer uh, see, you know, the color of the skin will not be, be, be the first thing that, that we think of when we meet one another. When you, when you think of uh, uh, Arbery and uh, Taylor and uh, Floyd, this is, this is, this is happening in, uh, you know, now. This is not ancient history. It, it's, a, it's a testimony to the fact that we have a long way to go, a long way. And then when you, uh, the, the, one of the, it's even difficult for me to talk about, it was a couple in, I think it was in, in, in uh, it, this was in Texas, not, not Port, uh, Portland, Oregon. A couple, man is, uh, well, was white and uh, woman black, but uh, quadriplegic was sitting in, in a wheelchair which the boyfriend, white, white boyfriend was pushing. And somebody for whatever reason decided that uh, that wasn't appropriate. So the man was shot and killed immediately. How do you explain that? It's, it's, it's beyond, beyond it's explaining. So America has been busy deluding itself, pretending that somehow if we don't talk about it, it may not go away, but then we, we won't be reminded about it. There, yeah. And as far as I'm concerned, racial discrimination, racism in America, you can lay the blame squarely, where, where do you think? At the doorstep of the church. 
because the essence of the Christian faith has nothing to do with fancy building and uh, fancy names. Like Jesus was not a Presbyterian. No worse he as my Southern Baptist friends will be disappointed to hear me say this. Neither was he a Southern Baptist or Catholic or Greek Orthodox. Because Jesus' most fervent prayer before his uh, uh, crucifixion was, Father, that they may be one, just like what? You and I are one. And what have we been busying ourselves doing? Division. Because whenever you build a wall, is that some people who are inside, I know I'm straying off what a conversation is supposed to be about, but you forgive me. Yeah. The church has... So the result is, Martin Luther King said it, and he said it very succinctly. He said the most segregated hour of the week is when? The hour between 11 and noon on Sunday. Think about it. Because during the week on the Mercer campus, Black people, employees of Mercer, you know, you work together. You may not be the best of friends, but you interact. You, uh, uh, Home Depot, uh, Kroger, black and white working together. All right? But on Sunday, when we shall be celebrating the oneness of one in God's family, that's when we underscore for the, uh, as a testament for the whole world our separatedness. And I have gone come up, come up to say that is not the most segregated hour. Well, it is, but worse than that, it is the most unholy hour of the week. And, and Mr. I think um, something I, I constantly talk with my students about and it brings a great point up is, is in looking at that, it presents an opportunity uh, to expose oneself to the other, right? Mm -hmm. One of the one of the things that I've realized in, in interacting um, with 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 difference and 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 I think this journey of tolerance is the lack of exposure to other. You get too comfortable, and and it's so easy to not get into spaces where you are the minority, right? Um, and I think something that we can all continue to do is challenge ourselves. To, to put ourselves in situations where we are the other, um, because there are a lot of folk, I think, who walk around every day and never know what that feels like, which is mind boggling. Uh, and I think all of us <laughs> in this conversation can speak on feeling like the other at many different points in our lives. Um, and I, I really would challenge not only our, our, our students, but anyone who's watching this, to, to get a little comfortable with getting uncomfortable and putting yourself out there with with not being in what feels like your space always because it's you're really um, you're robbing yourself of experiences when you don't put yourselves in those vulnerable situations I'd like to um, oh yes sir please well you are you Waiting for me to respond? Oh, yes. I thought you were going to. <laughs> oh, yes. It, it's, you know, when I left Mercer after graduation, I ended up at the University of California in Berkeley. Wow. wow. All right. And um, you might have learned your know, history, with, but, you know, it, it, was, um, it was the best thing that could have happened to me because when I left, I actually resolved, I made a solemn re uh, resolution, vow with myself, never, ever to step foot on Georgian soil, to say nothing of Southern soil. But that's, that wasn't a result, that vow, that resolve was not born of my experience on the Mercer campus. Mercer campus, uh, it was a kind of a benign neglect. I mean, you know, the people saw me and uh, they, they knew better that, than to interact with me because I mean, given the, the racial uh, milieu from which these students came from, all right. Consider that my, first, my very first first the uh, first day in the cafeteria, right? And I've made up my mind before I left home, left West Africa to come. I'm not going to be guilty of prejudice because you know that's prejudging. So. Um, 
smile at everybody and uh, ready to embrace friendship, whatever it will come. So first day in the cafeteria, uh, first experience, didn't even know what you were supposed to do, but I saw, I looked around and that's the way to learn. Just look around and look at what other people are doing. People are picking up trays and where they're walking to where they can, you know, load the trays with the food, the kind of food they want. And then they were taking those trays to tables. And so I did the same thing. And then, then I looked around. I said, rather than isolate myself, I'll look at a table where other students are already seated and I'll join them. And that was what I did. There must have been three or four, I forgot the number, it doesn't matter. But it was as if on cue, it was as if somebody <laughs> was watching and they're giving signal. No sooner had I set down my table, my, my table on my tray, that would be quite a trick. <laughs> no sooner had I set down my tray on the table than those other students picked up their trays one by one and walked away. Okay. Uh, but other than that, and I also remember <laughs> I received uh, a note in my mailbox, because you know, in those little mailboxes, and uh, you find out people's uh, mailbox that they can address, you know. I remember the, we essentially, uh, in bad Latin, uh, uh, it, it said, Ticu, Ticus Africanus, uh, no, no, it was something, uh, oh, Corpus Africanus, Ticus Lipus. And I, I know that, I think that Latin was my best subject, <laughs> next to English when I was in, in high school. So I knew that that was, it was even worse than the big Latin, okay. But what, what the message the person was trying to get across was to address my, you know, that I was either thick as an African and also have mm -hmm. thick lips, <laughs> you know, which, which for me, that is, that is stating the obvious. Uh, I had no responsibility to the shape of my head or my height and all that. And uh, when people realize that this absurdity of color categorization, it, was, it wasn't my responsibility. And even if it were, I happen to be comfortable in the skin that I'm in. All right? So there was on the campus itself, um, uh, professors were were good to me. Uh, didn't uh, um, I earned? The, but I know. A, I think we were a history professor who was really. It was really a struggle for him to be teaching a black student, and it was reflected in the in the grade that I got. But again, I didn't make an issue of it. Didn't make an issue of it. So the campus, uh, you know. You just as you change of classes and you walk past and you to go to your next class and um, nobody was was uh, ugly to me or um, um, so there was a kind of de um, benign tolerance you know they, they ignored me and um, and I didn't take um, offense at that knowing full well that yeah I'm a stranger in the midst and given what little I know of their own upbringing in the culture of uh, race and racism. Uh, I, I mean, I was aware of that. They verified that I would be, I'll be, it would be disingenuous on my part to say I wasn't uh, aware of race, even though that, that that would mean I wasn't aware that I was to be the first black student. You know, I was aware of it, and um, and I was made up my mind that um, uh, given the kind of uh, upbringing that I got too, that you know, self-assuredness self-confidence and um, so I wasn't going to let anybody look down on, on me or, or uh, belittle me. Not that I will retaliate, but, but it, it wouldn't be necessary because I, 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 I knew who I was as I do now and whose I was and whose I am. So I leave that problem where it belongs, namely with the person that decided to look down on me or to discriminate or whatever. So it wasn't uh, on the camp, campus was fine, but it was my spiritual experience. We got to uh, uh, Vineville Baptist Church, we went to Sunday school, which was a, a class of uh, college students, so there was no incident. And then uh, after Sunday school, we went into the sanctuary for the morning worship. 
and um, everything went well. At the end of the service, at the usual practice of inviting guests or people who might be considering becoming members of the church to step before the congregation so they could be welcome. So at the end of the service, the Reverend more than asked uh, people uh, new to the church you consider to, to stand, come stand before the congregation so they will be uh, greeted and welcomed. And so we, about 20 of us, I think, we lined up before the congregation and the minister then asked everybody to go back to their seats except me. He then proceed, he proceeded to introduce me. Friends, we're honored today to have among us a young man from the mission field, the mission field to which we too have been contributing, supporting, uh, at which point a man leapt to his feet. Reverend Moore, I'm not going to sit here and watch you destroy this church by bringing niggers into the congregation. And um, when he was done, a woman, and that woman's face is the one that is permanently stamped on my, on my consciousness. She was all red in the face. And she said, Reverend Moore, my grandfather, grandfather or great-grandfather helped to found this church. And you're about to destroy it, and I'm not going to stand for it. And another man got up and spoke in similar toxic vein. After which the Reverend Moore then said, okay, let's put the matter to a vote. All in favor of Sam O'Neill's membership, please raise your hands and the hands went up. All opposed, please raise your hands, the hands went up. And it was clear to any objective minded uh, person that a slim majority favored my membership. But the people, the, the opponents of my membership wouldn't give up. So the vote was taken the second time with similar result. Still, they wouldn't give up. So finally, Reverend Moore said, let's do a standing vote. All in favor, please stand. All opposed, please stand. It was then that the people opposed to my membership finally realized that they had lost the day. And that was how, whenever I tell the story, that was how I was tongue in cheek, I say, that was how I was warmly, lovingly, compassionately welcoming to a fellowship in the house of God. My first Sunday among the same people who sent the first missionary to my people 110 years previously. So when I left, vowing never to return. It was the struggle, spiritual struggle I've had all during the four years that led me to the conclusion that making Georgia uh, the, 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 the southern belt uh, will not, uh, the Bible belt rather, will not be a place for me to find spiritual repose. And uh, so, but then Six months after I got to Berkeley, I was in, in uh, another heaven. I mean, I was, I was in my elements. I was received with open arms. I mean, it, it, it was I'm an amazing, amazing experience. And uh, so, but it was a vow that was short, short lived because six months, exactly six months after I arrived in Berkeley, news flash. Martin Luther King had been gone down. And so to, to this day, I don't even remember how I brought my little Volkswagen Beetle to a stop. Was sobbing like a ba baby. And when I finally got myself together, I resolved then and there that the only way I knew to honor my brother, my prophet, my leader was to return, to break that vow, return to Georgia and be part of his memorial uh, funeral. And, and that was what I did. And uh, funeral over, I couldn't wait to get back to Berkeley where I have found uh, a, a, a very, very warm home, uh, new friends, uh, the very polar opposite of what the experience at Mercer University had been. And, uh, the rest, as they say, it's history. But the, but the same spirit that brought me to Mercer uh, 
it persists in, in me. That's why, you know, because I, 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 I think about it. Why, you know, I when I was returning, because I went back home for a while, when I was returning to California, you know, where I'd fallen in love with the city of uh, Berkeley, I was going to be returning, you know, but um, in 1994, middle 90s, the economy, everything was so crazy in California. So I said, uh, and in, in 94 was when the 30th anniversary of my coming to Mercer was being celebrated and I was asked to come and speak. And it was then that I was re-experiencing Georgia. And I realized that Georgia uh, of, uh, of the 94 was different from Georgia of 30 years previously. And I said, look, if you're going to make uh, start a new life in America, uh, Georgia may will be, might be just the, the, the place to do it. And another incentive was the Olympic Games coming, and I'm kind of a sports fanatic, you know. So, and I said to myself, it isn't every every lifetime that you get to visit an Olympic city. So, make it Georgia, stay in Atlanta, and that's what I have done. And uh, and because I happen to be in Atlanta, uh, what is 90 minutes or so away from uh, Mercer, every opportunity. And again, I say, send me uh, if I can meet with. Uh, uh, new students and share with them some of the some of the thoughts that I've shared with you. Uh, if you uh, if you if you consider it appropriate, I stand ready. I stand ready to to do so and to be involved in, in uh, making our beloved uh, alma mater uh, a great place. That's a, amazing. A, a healing place. And, uh, so, well, again, I'm. I'm incredibly humbled and, and feel very privileged to have been able to have this time with you um and with you cam as always it's been a delight um and i'm sure we'll be talking again soon um and uh yeah any any parting words for the class of 2024 no just come remember that somebody said uh, the mind is like a parachute it's only useful when it is open. Wow. Very true. I wish that, that we wish I could claim, uh, uh, <laughs> Doctor, I didn't, that isn't original with me, okay? <laughs> Did we lose? Uh, I think, yeah. yeah, I think her internet dropped. I just texted her, but. Um, yeah, so, so come with an open mind. Yes. And come ready. That's what getting an education is about, ready to be transformed to transcend, you know, what you've learned in high school, what you've learned, grew up with, inculcated in Milledgeville, and try to. And that's how we, we, all, we, all, we all witness um, John, John Lewis, uh, Troy. You, you almost need a magnifying glass to spot Troy on the map, right? Yeah. But they come, and the people come from these little places. And I, from from um, Sekondita Kuradi in Ghana, and you, you just with an open mind, ready to be uh, filled with new ideas, new knowledge, new experiences, and and using those new ideas and new experiences to contribute to making this world of ours what a better place a commitment and uh, now many of us get very squeamish about that Pablo okay. we get we get squeamish it's only little me all right little me but somebody said again another wise word that I did not original with me Pablo <laughs> they said you cannot do all the good that the world needs you ready for the, the punchline but the world needs every little good that you can do. True. Absolutely true. Thank you for the opportunity, and I look forward to uh, working with you. Namaste. Namaste, sir. Thank you so, so much. I'll be talking to you all very soon. I oh, look forward to it. <laughs> all right, Ken. Mr. Ray, thank you so much for your time. Bye-bye. The pleasure has been mine. Bye-bye <laughs> for now.